What's up, citizens? Welcome to the City Square Podcast, where we talk with everyday people about faith and work. My name is John. And if this is your first time tuning in, please take a quick moment to subscribe to the channel. Uh, please like the video, click the bell. And as the conversation is going along, feel free to drop any comments or any questions you have. Um, as you know from other videos, this helps us grow the channel. It creates exposure. And it also it gives you an opportunity to interact with us with the conversation that we're having. Uh, today, my guest is Gregory Baus. He's an independent writer, a researcher, and he is also the co-host of the Reformed Libertarians podcast. How are you doing today, man? Great. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, man. We've been trying to get the schedule for a few months now. I'm glad we uh, finally kind of got it working. I think last time um, my fiber was down, which was embarrassing, but here we are finally. Yep. We both have <laughs> moderately working internets. <laughs> I know we've uh, done a little bit of a, we've interacted uh, qu quite a bit on social media, uh, just about theology and politics and that kind of stuff. And so I'm glad for us to like finally be able to sit down and be able to have a good conversation about important things and just see what happens. Yeah. I, I, I might ask you some questions. Because I forget yeah, man. Half, half the things we talked about. <laughs> yeah, let's let's do it, man. <laughs> but um, I mean, um, did you grow up in the church, or did you uh, did God save you like later on in life? Yes, I grew up uh, m for the most part in Baltimore, Maryland, and nice. in the Orthodox Presbyterian Church. My parents were late high school, college era <laughs> converts uh okay, they met cool. they met in a church so uh when they married and i was born they had already entered the orthodox presbyterian denomination and i was baptized and catechized <laughs> and uh as long as i can remember pretty early i was always conscious of my love for and faith in the Lord Jesus. Although, <clears throat> yeah, as I grew, of course, um, my understanding of the faith and my conscious embrace of the faith increased. So yeah. I think that's, I think that's pretty typical for people right. who grow up uh, as Christians. There are different, sort of stages in their life as well as their faith. Right. I've met a couple people who um, grew up uh, in the church. They always, their parents were, were believers. They can't remember not going to Sunday school, not going to service and that kind of thing. And so like, they really cannot remember um, not being a Christian, which is, interesting for like for somebody such as myself who um was saved in my freshman year in college in 2005 and so like for me i can like actually just remember a time before at a time as and so it's always it's just interesting uh for somebody like such as myself who to hear like well i actually cannot remember a time when i cannot remember a time when i wasn't praying i can't remember a time that i didn't believe and i can't remember a time that being in church around believers and that kind of thing. And so it's just for somebody such as myself, that's just, that's fascinating. Like, it's awesome. Like, it's great. Like, I think that's what any good Christian father and mother would want for their kids. And that's incredible. It just for me, it's just different. Yeah. I, I consider it a kind of privilege and it's always by the grace of God. Of course, um, kids grew up, in Christian homes that uh, aren't converted from their earliest youth, you know, either. Yeah. Well, some of course never come to faith some later, but right. I would expect any adult convert who has children that that's what they hope for their own kids. And I have tried to, you know, not take it for granted. Absolutely, man. Um, you said Orthodox 
Presbyterian. Um, what makes that, I mean, different from something like the, 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 um, like the PCA, for example? <clears throat> well, the Orthodox Presbyterian Church, I guess I'll plug their website, opc.org. <laughs> and they, they actually have a great, uh, history uh series let's see it's called turning points in american presbyterian history i think the if you just search for it on there you'd find it but i think it may just be opc.org slash turning points dot html or something and you can read the several entries there uh, the authors expanded it into a larger book, I think called Seeking a Better Country. That might be the title of it. Anyway, Daryl Hart, John Meather. And uh, let's see. Well, so I was going to... So that would introduce a lot of people to the history, but there is an organization of... or an, an ecumenical council, so to speak, of conservative, reformed, and Presbyterian churches in North America. That's called NAPARC, the North American Presbyterian and Reformed Council, maybe. So it's a collection of about 13 or so denominations that all are conservative, so to speak, uh, confessionally reformed denominations, reformed or Presbyterian. And the PCA is part of that, as well as the uh, Reformed Presbyterian Church, the ARP, the Associate Reformed Presbyterians, a uh, number of a couple of Korean Presbyterian denominations, and then from the Continental Reform side, there's the German Reformed Church, which is the uh, RCUS. That may be the oldest established. Uh, Reformed denomination and definitely the oldest continuing one in that group. Yes. Yeah. There's the URC, which is the spiritual heir of the CRC. That was Kuiper's, Abraham Kuiper's denomination in North America. And let's see a number of others that there, there's uh, the, Quebec Reformed. They're the replanted French Reformed in Quebec. Uh, and the HRC, the Heritage Reformed. Joel Beakey, as people say. Oh, it's okay. Beka, but um, his denomination, uh, you know, he, he he's one of the leading pastors, theologians in that denomination. People know it by that. Um, Puritan Reformed denomination I don't, or uh, seminary. I don't know if they're directly connected, but they tend to be. So they're all grouped together. And, and these denominations have different, some have different sort of ethnic immigration, heritage, background from uh, European settlers. The Orthodox Presbyterian Church around 1936 came out of the northern mainline Presbyterian denomination because it was infected with liberalism and attempts at reforming that denomination failed. And the PCA came out of the southern Presbyterian church in the 70s, so some 40 years later. And there have been different attempts over the years for them to get together. Uh, the PCA has gone through a lot more, hmm, we say growing pains. <laughs> uh, I don't know if a lot more, but actually now that I think of it, but more recent ones uh, in trying to become a more consciously reform confessionally reformed denomination okay you know they were very broad evangel broad evangelical for some time and 
there's a lot of congregations in that denomination that I would never choose to be a member of. <laughs> <laughs> but there's a lot of them. Yeah. They're the perhaps the biggest. I forget how large they are. Three, three hundred thousand or something. Yeah. So uh, you've said this a couple times, man, and I'm just kind of curious your thoughts. Um, why is being confessional, confessionally reformed, something that should matter? Well, you know, uh, your listeners, if they're interested in that question, they might look at uh, Carl Truman's book. I I think it's called The Creedal Imperative. Okay. Anyway, there's another book similar to it by J. V. Fesco. Um, maybe it's called like Why Creeds Matter or something like that. Uh, but both those books, as I understand it, uh, I, I've, I'm sort of familiar with them in a cursory way. They explain that uh, a a church is when it says explicitly what it is that they think the Bible teaches, that's that's essentially to be confessional. Gotcha. Yeah. And the the term confessional or creedal means that your own congregation or association of churches isn't making this up isn't making up their statement of faith kind of de novo, you know, out of the blue from their own resources, but is looking back to what the history of the church has said in the past. So to, you know, there's some value in that, at least when you read the creeds or you read the reformation era confessions, and you're like, yeah, there's, there's a lot of uh, wisdom here. I think this does better reflect the teaching of scripture more than we ever could have come up with on our own. Uh, so the churches who have found that to be the case and, and hold to those statements of faith as scripturally faithful, uh, that's... That's what it is to be confessional. Of course, there's other kinds of confessional churches that are not reformed, right? Uh, such as Lutheran or Anglican or whatever. Uh, Baptist uh, can be a kind, you know, depending on which confession they embrace, more or less reformed, more or less akin to the theology of the or the confessional faith of the. Presbyterian and Reformed congregations. So, awesome, man. That's good stuff. So, like you, uh, you grew up in the the Presbyterian Church. Um, are you still theologically Reformed? And so, I assume that you are. You still consider yourself? Are you at a Presbyterian Church now? Have you stayed that way? Yes, yes. Here in Albuquerque, the OPC congregation is called Albuquerque Reformed. They were established some 40 years ago, I guess, back in the 80s, uh, and kind of died off. But then a few remaining members, uh, for various reasons, uh, a few remaining members decided to call a new pastor this year. So I am happy to be attending there regularly. Uh, they have a great historically reformed liturgy. That's very important to me. Um, a church that's also conscious of not just the theology, but of the scriptural practice <laughs> of, uh, <laughs> of reformed churches and worships according to what's known as the regulative principle and follows an order of worship that we think uh, is reflective of the Bible's teaching about what the order of worship should be. 
but uh, yeah, when I when I was in high school, early high school, I began reading a study on the Westminster Confession. Uh, there was one written by a fellow who died not long ago named G.I. Williamson. He also wrote a study book on the Shorter Catechism and Westminster Shorter Catechism and on the Heidelberg Catechism. And I recommend all three of those study books to your listeners. Really good introductions. He basically goes through each subject subsection and highlights the main points being taught and has a little discussion on those and has some questions at the end. So, and then of course the catechism just goes through each question and answer. And if, if anyone feels like they don't have as solid of a quote, you know, you might say a systematic theological education as they could, that's one of the best ways to do it. You just read one of these study books on the confession or catechisms and you'll, you'll know a lot more than I dare to say (laughs) many, many elders, (laughs) but in any case, uh, so I had done that in high school and boy, I was sold out. I was 100%. That's what, so uh, like on, in high school, you were like board. 100% on board. Oh, yeah. Nice, man. Yeah, for my 15th birthday, I got uh, Calvin's Institutes and I was raring to go. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I never looked back. And, you know, I just mentioned worship. That That definitely was one of the important things that shaped my identity as a believer, as a particular reformed believer, uh, just, you know, I, I quickly became conscious of my not being an evangelical. And I would say that one of the distinguishing features is evangelicals largely are not confessional, right? So they're not looking to a historic statement of faith they're they're acting like uh the church began you know as some people say when their pastor was born (laughs) something like that so you know it's a historical theological ignorance in the sense of they don't know about it but they're also ignoring it right and um In any case, it's not just doctrine, it's worship. In Calvin's The Necessity of Reforming the Church, I forget what year that was. You can find that online and read it. Uh, He says there's there's two things that the Reformation is about. First, about restoring the right worship of God. And that, uh, you know, a lot of people who are just coming into the reform faith might not be conscious of that. You know, they sort of hit, it seems to me, they sort of hit uh, thinking about worship secondarily uh, rather than as a primary issue. So the That's regular interesting. Yeah. Because the like regular if you, principle is key. Yeah. Because like if you uh, go to like a, like a, I mean, just in maybe like a non-denominational evangelical charismatic ish church, it's, that's not the case. It's well, I'm here for the music and I stayed for the music and I'll sit through the sermon because I don't want to be rude and get up and then I'll leave and I'll come back for the music next time. Yeah. You know, yeah, it's uh it's a nice little pop concert with a Ted talk <laughs> or whatever. You know, yeah, and that is formative of a deformed Christianity. I mean, not only is the doctrine bad, but it's being uh, distorted in practice through a false conception of piety. And in any case, that's one of my hobby horses. <laughs> it's the importance <laughs> of the regulative principle 
and a reformed order of worship and the singing of the Psalms and observance of the Lord's day and how key that that is to spiritual formation. That, that's how, that's how people talk about it these days. That's a, that's a fancy, or that's a buzzword for spiritual formation. Uh, okay. It, it could refer to partially sanctification, uh, discipleship, growing in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. The, uh, worship's a key part of that. So, the second thing that Calvin hit in the necessity of reforming the church was the proper understanding of the way in which we come into a right relationship with God, the way in, you know, understanding of salvation. And uh, so it's those two things that are uh, really key. Nice one. As a uh, somebody who has basically grew up in the Presbyterian Church and was reading Calvin's Institutes, apparently his freshman year in high school, which is incredible, by the way. <laughs> um, why do you think it is that uh, people are? You see people, they say flocking to. I think that's being used pretty liberally, like the Eastern Orthodox tradition and that. Well, I guess the Eastern Orthodox, the Eastern Orthodox, Greek Orthodox traditions, and those kind of things. Yeah, and I would say also to forms of Anglicanism as yeah. well as Roman Catholic in some cases. Right. Uh, I I think it's because of the the lack of historic Christianity embodied in broad evangelicalism, that's for sure. And those that have, I guess, dallied with the Reformed faith uh, understood little yeah. about how it's more faithful to uh, not only the scriptures, but also the early church. And yeah, I mean, for example, uh, icons <laughs> is, is such a big deal, uh, particularly in the Eastern churches. But if you look at the history of that, you know, that was a, total, as we say, accretion, you know, the Orthodox church, the, you know, universally was entirely opposed. It was an iconic, it was non picture oriented for the first 800 years. And it was those Akana dual councils that reverse the whole thing, but, uh, without historical basis in the confession of the church up to that point. Uh, let me see, uh, Gavin Ortland. I think he, I think the name of his video on this topic was something like the number one reason to be Protestant or something, something like that. And, you know, if, if anyone who's listening, uh, is flirting with iconic traditions, Roman Catholicism, Eastern Orthodoxy, even forms of Lutheranism or uh, Anglicanism. They should go go listen to that. That would be helpful, I think. I mean, because it's in it's incontestable. Yeah, but yeah, because it's the vapidity of evangelical Christianity. And while a lot of people sort of think of that as, you know, just sort of basic Protestantism, it's not, it's a total departure 
and this occurred, you know, around the Civil War era and the Second Great Awakening, this revivalistic view of Christianity is what really produced uh, American evangelicalism. And it is a sham. It is, you know, in various ways, sometimes quite heretical, but more or less heretical, basically, in all its forms. And the more we can encourage people to flee <laughs> from evangelicalism and become confessionally reformed, yeah, that's, that's, that's one of my missions, I'd say. So, you know, I, 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 as I think about maybe my calling the intellectual or academic side of my calling in life, it is helping people come to understand the confessional reform faith and to embrace it and to practice it, you know, so it's in all its dimensions and its historical and scriptural richness. And so that's one aspect. And a key part of that has been what is sometimes called the covenantal, redemptive, historical, biblical, theological approach. We could talk more about that. But also, philosophically, you know, and in a way that's rooted in the Reformed faith, what is sometimes called Reformational philosophy. That's quite important to me. Sometimes people think of it in terms of uh, Neo-Calvinism, and that's fair, although there's issues with the Neo-Calvinistic uh, movement, and generally. And, and the third part would be politically, politically, economically, uh, libertarian thought, and particularly anarchistic uh, libertarianism. So the, those three, those three points uh, coming together as sort of the focus of my of my mission. <laughs> gotcha, man. Gotcha. <laughs> yeah. Um, what's the issue with the neo Calvinistic movement? Well, after you know and. I don't know how much your listeners are familiar uh, with it as it sprung up in the Netherlands at the turn of the previous century, late 1800s. Um, around the time of the Second Great Awakening, there was also a revival of Orthodox Calvinism, uh, mostly in Europe, where the confessional theology, the Orthodox Reformed theology of the prior several hundred years uh, had been gutted by uh, theological liberalism. So sometimes this is referred to by the French term, the revaille, and uh, that's just... Uh, it just means like awakening yeah, or revival, the awakening. So, but the Calvinistic Ravai is um, influenced the Netherlands. And that is what in turn led to this flowering of, you could say, reformed worldview thinking. And the key figures there are Herman Bovink and Abraham Kuyper. And in the next generation after World War II, or he was actually somewhat prior, but then also following uh, the philosophical work of Hermann Doivert, and I'm a promoter of his philosophical perspective. But one of the big problems was, is that after World War II, along with Europe generally, the neo-Calvinist movement became increasingly statist. You'd, you'd, you'd think 
they wouldn't make that mistake <laughs> given their experience with fascism yeah. and Nazism and the encroaching Soviet Union. But the, the whole, uh, the reason those movements existed is because people had not understood the lessons taught to them by the earlier classical liberals the pr proto libertarians they abandoned those things or it didn't the message didn't get through and so even after world war ii uh, the netherlands as a whole and the dutch neo-calvinists uh along with it became increasingly uh statist uh and doiver tried to warn them he wrote a number of articles on the problems with a command economy, uh, essentially a controlled economy. And, but that just fell on deaf ears. And so a lot of really crappy <laughs> economics and uh, bad political perspective just sort of developed within neo Calvinism. And it needs to be purged of that, but that's a, that's a hard, hard, long <laughs> labor. I'm afraid we'll, we'll see how that comes about. So yeah. Most of the, uh, I think the listeners of our podcast, uh, probably have a theologically reformed background and a theologically Lutheran background. I'd probably say that's the majority of them. So, right. You have a, you started getting into economics. Uh, how did you get into libertarianism? Well, when I was, I, I was always somewhat of a classical liberal. Um, I'd say my dad was kind of a Goldwaterite, you know, kind of as he came up consciously, politically, yeah. sort of an advocate of Barry Goldwater sort of perspective so that's where he was so all that made a lot of sense to me and in my freshman year of college i encountered what was then called the u.s taxpayers party which became the uh, constitution party and i met howard phillips who was the sort of organizer of that party and he just really through some of his writings and meeting him talking to him personally turned me on to the 10th amendment, for example. And I came to recognize that, you know, 99% of what the federal government does is illegal. And so, yeah, I would say I basically, I mean, I was a constitutionalist. So whether that makes me had made me exactly libertarian, not, not quite yet. But uh, I, from, from that point on, I was sort of tending in a more libertarian direction. And around when I was in grad school the first time, <laughs> around 2005, 2006, I was like, I need to get a handle on this uh, economic stuff. <laughs> and I was uh, reading more about the Federal Reserve and so on. And, you know, found the... Mises Institute and through some of that material became explicitly uh, libertarian, embracing self-ownership and property rights and the non-aggression principle. And then tried to come to understand that in terms of my reformed uh, convictions more consistently. And yeah, so that was around 2008 that the light bulb went off as it were. <laughs> it's my, my political, my political conversion. Mine was around 2008 also. Um, I'm, I'm not complicated though, man. Um, like I saw a bumper sticker that said Google Ron Paul. So I did. <laughs> hey, awesome. <laughs> And um, yeah, I had yeah. actually known about Ron Paul before I went to yeah. his office. 
around 2003. Oh, nice. I one. think. Yeah, I had a friend who was a staffer. <laughs> That's <And> awesome. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, so they're friends. And um, yeah, so, but he wasn't there. Oh, oh I was disappointed. Yeah, no, so I never met him in person, but I, I did sneak behind his <laughs> desk. So some, somewhere there's a picture of me with his uh, don't steal the government hates competition thing kind of in the picture. Uh, nice. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I wasn't fully on board even then, even though I knew about it. Yeah. I think I thought of him more as a constitutionalist, which of course he was in some ways. Uh, but yeah, I wonder what a conversation with him would have done if he would have said, "Now nah, you don't quite get it, kid. <laughs> or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So like, how does, because so, is there a difference between libertarianism and anarchism? Well, uh, I think anarchism as the rejection of the mon monopoly of the state. Okay. The way I define state is it's inherently a, a monopolistic institution. Fair. But uh, so it's a rejection of that. It's a rejection of the legitimacy of the monopolization of civil governance functions, namely adjudication of disputes over crime and the rules and enforcement that go along with that. So saying that it is not legitimate to monopolize that flows out of, so that's anarchism and that flows out of the central principle of libertarianism, which is the non-aggression principle. But of course the non-aggression principle, which is that you shouldn't initiate coercion against anyone else's person or property, that that's illegitimate. Uh, that is the obligatory correlate to either depending on how you conceive of it, one or two other prior principles. And that is self-ownership that every human being is a self-owner uh, with respect to other human beings. You know, God, God, God owns us all humans and everything. So with respect to God, we're just stewards of our lives, but that stewardship that God gives everyone of their own life becomes with regard to other people, self-ownership. And property rights, that is ownership of property, that, that through original acquisition or trade or gift or what have you, we can own rivalrous goods. So those two things entail an obligation not to initiate coercion against other people's persons and property. So that's libertarianism. And I think applying that uh, to civil governance and recognizing that any assertion of monopoly is in effect an initiation of coercion inherently, necessarily, and therefore must be rejected is what produces politically an anarchist uh, understanding. So it's not a rejection, at least in my view, in the reformed view, not a rejection of the legit legitimacy and in fact necessity of civil governance, but of its monopolization and thus rejection of the state as a corrupted form of civil governance. So you kind of just touch on a second ago. What I wanted to, one of the things I want to ask you is that why, like I said, you kind of touch on a little bit, but maybe if you can expand a little more, like 
why should every Christian be an anarchist? Yeah, I think it's not necessary in order to embrace the gospel, in order to put your trust for salvation in Christ alone. It's not necessary to have any political, economic opinions or opinions of really any other kind necessarily. Uh, there are certain beliefs about who God is, <laughs> the, the nature of Christ's person and his uh, work on the cross that if you had wrong ideas about those, it could conflict with what the gospel is yeah, and really, you know, and what it means to embrace it in faith. Uh, but in order to, for the Holy spirit to regenerate you and give you genuine faith in Christ alone, that's not, uh, none of those other things are necessary. Thank God. So, uh, you know, the most ignorant person, <laughs> the most unlearned person can be a Christian. And, but at the same time, having a proper understanding of the world God made and what it's like, Christians should be anarchists because that's the way God properly designed the world <laughs> should be libertarian <laughs> and, and, and anarchists because that's according to, uh, a, let's say a normative understanding, right? So if you say, uh, when, when we're dealing with, I don't know, the laws of nature in terms of like physical reality, chemistry, biology, and even mathematics or something like that, or physics or whatever, uh, you, you can, you can misunderstand those things about the nature of the world, but obviously that doesn't affect how they actually operate. <laughs> yeah. The reason, the reason Christians should have X or Y or Z view of any of those different sort of forms of knowledge about the world is because God created the world that way. And we should have an interest uh, in understanding the world aright. Uh, one, because it serves glorifying God. Uh, but two, in our restoration uh, in Christ's image, part of what that means is then living in the world in increasing conformity uh, to, to God's design. So the what we call the normative sort of dimensions of human existence, whether it be art or linguistics or anything else. <laughs> uh, as we come to understand how God designed the world to be even after the fall, right? So there's a creational design and then there's a sort of a dimension about um, how we're to, how human beings are to live in the world in light of the fall. Obviously, that's particularly relevant to uh, political things, to the use of the legitimate use of coercion in service of the administration of civil justice. And yeah, because it's in accordance with the norms 
or the normative law that God built into the world. And that's why Christians should be concerned with those things and understand them as accurately as possible. You know, we're all, you know, we all have limitations. So it's not uh, sort of a recognition that we're not going to have perfect knowledge of these things. It go, goes with the territory. Um, but it's also important for the life of the church. Uh, while we know that Christians individually and uh, churches collectively will suffer persecution and rejection. Uh, it's not that, you know, we don't, we don't want to promote the conditions of persecution. Like if we all thought that that was somehow better than living in a freer society, you know, we could all move to North Korea and become <laughs> immediately executed or whatever, you know, or Saudi Arabia or whatever, wherever they're uh, opposing the church of Jesus Christ and persecuting, persecuting Christians. So, yeah, so a freer society is better for the promotion of the gospel and the uh, advancement of an understanding of the, of the scriptures. Yeah. So what is your uh, take on the new uh, spike of conversation and um, not just a spike of conversation, but the newfound, like, I think promotion, I guess, of uh, Christian nationalism. Well, uh, Carrie Baldwin and I, my co-host with the Reformed Libertarians podcast, we're on, we're still on break right now. We meant to only take a break for summer. And then I moved across the country and you know, got a little feedback there. And, uh, that that's uh that i'm i'm still getting settled <laughs> <laughs> with different jobs and so on in any case uh we in our 15th episode we tried to address christian nationalism in principle dealing with mm, maybe two and a half topics related to that and why we didn't think civil government should be theocratic in a in the new covenant era so we address the monopoly issue and we address the yeah. issue of establishmentarianism and I, I that's sort of the key point for me uh with regard to christian nationalism and then we touched on eschatological views so we said a word about post-millennialism and try to explain why that wasn't only a matter of over-realized eschatology, but particularly an under-realized eschatology. And if that sparks people's interest, <laughs> uh, they should listen to the episode and where we talk about the fulfillment of and the uh, abrogation of the old covenant and the establishment of the new and the significance that that has for uh, society in the in yeah. the new, new covenant era, yeah. Well, definitely, uh, without question, link to the Reformed Libertarians podcast down in the description, and not a problem. But I think one of the reasons for its uh, seeming rising popularity is because just like its approach to the Christian faith and to worship, you know, to theology, piety, and practice, the way that evangelicalism is distort a distortion of Christianity and severely lacking 
Um, of course, that's also the case with its approach to politics. And so when people are like, yeah, hey, there's nothing here, man, there's no answers here. Well, they're not wrong, <laughs> but they're looking in the wrong place for an answer. Yeah. Gotcha. I know that it's, it's a conversation that seems to be, at least in my experience, is shifting um, a lot. And so I know when I was in college, whenever I heard would hear like the term Christian nationalist, it was usually in reference to like the idea that like America is the new Israel. Mm-hmm. And it was just some mm-hmm. weird stuff like that. And now I think maybe it's just because I'm getting, I've gotten more exposed to more, I guess, reform circles because a lot of the reform, Christian nationalist conversation now is in reform circles. Yeah. It's a lot different. It's more about, sometimes it's more theocracy, theonomy, or it's very general and vague. And it's just, well, we should want our nation to be influenced by Christian theology and morals and that kind of thing. So that's what we mean. And so it's a confusing conversation where I think a lot of people end up just talking at each other instead of to each other. Yeah. Well, previous to moving here to the Southwest, I was in middle Pennsylvania and I wasn't really, I mean, I was in a pretty rural area and so I was interacting with very few people generally, (laughs) uh, let alone people of one particular stripe or another. Um, (laughs) so I guess I'm, I'm, I'm being back in a populated area is still new for me here, but outside the internet, have you encountered, uh, does, I mean, in the actual real life (laughs) circles that you're in, have you encountered any of that? Any of the sort of so Christian national stuff in Texas? Uh, yes. Uh, but it's just like with everything else, it's nowhere near as obnoxious as it is on the internet. Um, (laughs) (laughs) uh, I've, I've experienced some, uh, but it just depends on what that word means. And so like, so for example, when I first heard about Christian nationalism, it was through like, um, Robert Jeffers. I don't know if you're familiar with who that is. Uh, but he's the pastor. Sort of, of rings First, a bell, but I'm not really. Okay, he's he the, uh, the pastor of First Baptist Church in Dallas. Oh, okay. And like, his he's kind of weird on that. Uh, like, they wrote a "Make America Great Again" him for their church uh, in 2016. Um, and like, they're wow. kind of that's. I got I got to look that up. That sounds crazy. <laughs> Wonder if it's um, uh, completely wacko. <laughs> but like i think as more as like the the doug wilson tribe gets more exposure and becomes more popular like their version of like what christian nationalism is is different than robert jeffress's is um but i think most of the people i i know personally when they say christian nationalism what they mean is we want to see nations overflowing like with christianity like we want yeah. to see everybody yeah. saved. We want to see like the morals of Christianity like dominate the culture. And they, yeah. they want a more. Know, they want a more godly society. Yeah, they want more professing Christians. They they have zero sophistication about you know what that means for government, except maybe you know let's get rid of gay marriage. Let's get rid of legalized abortion uh let's stop promoting sexual perversion right you know stuff like that which is all good you know we would affirm let's let's not have any of that (laughs) yeah yeah right like let's stop legalizing the butchering of kids yeah private parts yep yeah But yeah, so I mean, it's, it's different, but like, so the I guess to answer your question, yes and no at the same time. 
Um, like, I don't know of anybody who is upset about people from different ethnicities or different nations getting married to each other, uh, which is what supposedly uh, Wolf said in his book, but I haven't read it yet. I just read mm -hmm. a, a couple blogs about it. I haven't read it, but that's apparently like what he covers in one chapter, which is awkward at minimum. Yeah, he has a confused. He has a confused uh, ethno aspect, and that that basically comes from his. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what to call it. It's sort of like an etymological fallacy because he's he's taking the word nation and he's saying well that means ethnicity therefore nation states that is political entities that we also use the word nation to refer to should be ethnic <laughs> and it's like hey uh that's not how language works <laughs> uh it's not how the concepts need to work and that's just false uh so you know the fact that organized political entities you know often are connected to you know they're connected to territories and so within a given region often there is a predominant ethnic group not always universally everywhere of course uh people are always in fact eth ethnicities are not at in any way stable they're always mutating just like languages so um yeah anyway it's really really silly i think not not to be taken seriously as a proposal in any way <laughs> <laughs> but well hey man i appreciate you for coming on man Oh yeah. Well, let me say that uh let me let me plug, I guess, a few more things yeah. that may be of interest to your listeners. Do it. Uh so before I was mentioning the covenantal, redemptive historical, biblical theological sort of approach uh in theology. And if they haven't heard the name, the name uh, Gerhardus Voss, V O S, he was sort of the granddaddy of developing that kind of thinking uh, in the modern era, so to speak, in reform circles. And writers like Meredith Klein, K L I N E, Meredith, I am a man. Klein. <laughs> Not many men are named <laughs> Meredith these days. Uh, and uh, Herman Ritterboss. Uh, the writings of these people in the same genre, maybe uh, a living example might be uh, somebody like G.K. Beale, Greg Beale, um, and there and there are plenty of others. Uh, it's that it's that sort of perspective within the reformed view that you really need to start reading up on <laughs> because a lot of what passes for uh, reformed thinking is confused like the theonomic stuff. So if you're like, well what's what's the you know heavy hitting, you know, serious, good theology that's not theonomic, it's this. That's what I'm talking about. So that's what you want to read. Uh, the Reformed Libertarians podcast, we're going to try to hit some of the, some of those topics uh, more explicitly. Nice. And uh, with the philosophy, let me just recommend the website. Um, Herman, which is spelled in the normal way, <laughs> hyphen Doyevert, and I'm just going to spell it D-O-O-Y-E-W-E-E-R-D. -E -E so there's two O's and all together three E's. D-O-O-Y-E-W-W, -E -W -W, uh, 
or is it double E R D? We can uh Herman hyphen. What's that? I was gonna say we can link. We'll we'll link them below, man. So like, yeah, yeah. Dot blogspot dot com. That's where there's some resources. In any case, uh, I'll I'll send you the link for the first two chapters of this one book that's in Doivert's own writing. The great the greatest intro I think that he wrote to his own perspective. And uh, so, if people are curious. Uh, they should take a look at that. And um, yeah, so those things together with libertarianism, particularly from a reformed confessional standpoint, are really what I'm interested in promoting. And, uh, you know, it's not a matter of you can't be it's it's not as though you can't be a faithful christian or uh how do you say it's not as though you couldn't be genuine <laughs> in your faith and love for christ and service to him and growing in grace and so on without a kind of academic knowledge of these topics. But for those who are capable of reading and understanding, uh, you know, this is the perspective that I want to recommend um, as in you know, the most helpfully consistent way of addressing those topics. And uh, I think maybe, you know, that's the kind of thing that uh, in your lifetime, you would say that you've come in contact with and has inspired you to have these kinds of conversations about these topics. For sure. Yeah. I think, I think this is what you're, uh, your listeners would be interested in. Oh yeah, man. Absolutely. Definitely. I have no doubt about that. We can, yeah, those resources we just discussed, man, we can link those below. Uh, we'll gladly uh, link uh, to the reformed libertarians podcast, especially the episode that you referenced before. I think it was number 15. Uh, we'll put that down there as well. Yep. Yeah. Great. Awesome. And um, where can everybody find you and support you at? Well, let's see. I uh, I don't exactly have some kind of web presence or anything where I'm putting st stuff out regularly. I mean, I I did have a, a YouTube channel where I was putting out a few things. People might be interested in looking at that. That's uh, reformational. So yes. if they look up reformational <laughs> on YouTube, it's my youtube profile they can they can find stuff there i have had a blog for a long time which i haven't written in consistently and then was trying to start a uh what's it called Substack as an alternative or uh, you know republishing stuff there but i haven't really kept up with that but anyway the uh the blog is honest to blog dot blogspot.com so it's honest the digit two blog dot blogspot.com so they can find me there and there's links to both on the reformed libertarians podcast page and the blog to my web profile quote unquote uh that says a little bit more about my biography if people are nice. interested with links and yeah, and if anybody wants to contact me, uh, you know, my email's up there, so I'm happy happy to chat. <laughs> Perfect, man. That's awesome. Um, can you share three books that you're currently reading? Yes. 
Hey, is this going to appear in uh, video form or just audio form? Yes. In a, yeah, oh, yeah? video. Yeah. Ah. Uh, <laughs> well, now it's too far away now. I won't bother oh. getting up from my seat. No, you want me to go grab a, a book so you can see the uh, yeah. cover? Okay, I thought, hold on. I thought you... I thought you knew, man. That's why you were adjusting for the light earlier. <laughs> oh, that was just so it didn't yeah. annoy me. But oh, yeah, okay. okay. <laughs> hold on. For, hold on for a second. Let me grab All this right. book. Okay. So uh, here's one that's um, outside my outside my normal kind of pleasure education reading. Uh, as you know, or as you may know, the co-host of the Reformed Libertarians podcast, Carrie Baldwin, is a Socratic, Socratic seminar teacher, and I am trying to, I'm reading a book that is helping me understand better, as they call it, Socratic practice in the classroom. Oh, nice. It's sort of a methodological thing. Uh, the author of the book is Michael Strong, and it's called The Habit of Thought from Socratic Seminars to Socratic Practice. He is also interesting because he's married to uh, Magat Wad, Wade. I don't know. She is a I forget where she's from in Africa, the name of the country. Sorry, Magat. <laughs> name of country slipping in my mind. One, one of the West African countries. Um, anyway, uh, who wrote the book, something like The Heart of a Cheetah. And she's promoting free market economics. Uh, and explaining why Africa is poor when it doesn't have to be. So people should look that up too. But anyway, Michael Strong's book on uh, Socratic methodology, I'm starting to read that. Um, there's a book by a 1689 Calvinistic Baptist named Michael Beck, who is speaking of Africa is South African, but he lives in New Zealand and he just wrote uh, a book somewhat on Meredith Klein and the two kingdoms view. And he's interacting with John frames, pers perspectivalism, uh, theonomy, and supposedly also Herman Doiverd and neo-Calvinism, but not really. Yeah, which is one of my critiques. But this is an interesting book. Uh, Covenant Lord and Cultic Boundary by Michael Beck. Nice. So that's definitely interesting. It's a dissertation, but it's produced by um, Whitfenstock, Pickwick. There are Pickwick publications. And then there is David Van Drunen's Politics After Christendom, Political Theology in a Fractured World. And he's professor at Westminster Seminary, California. And this was hmm. published uh, in 2020. And I've interacted with him personally on some of the things I've read in here. I'm going to go out on a limb and say he doesn't know it but he's an anarchist <laughs> and no one who has read this book knows it. <laughs> so, uh, I think some of the perspectives he advocates in this book, um, are very supportive of libertarian anarchism. And he, d he kind of messes up the bit with Romans 13 he doesn't seem to reflect any, uh, I mean, I can only assume he is, but in the book, he doesn't reflect any awareness of 
the historical uh, political resistance perspective on Romans 13. I'll put a link for that. I'll, I'll give you a link for that for people who are interested. So that is everything here, but uh, well, I guess it, 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 it covers the sort of politics, uh, theology, and philosophy triad a little bit. Yeah. Nice one. Those books that I've been looking at. All of those actually sound interesting. So that's actually awesome. <laughs> okay, great. Yes, they are all interesting. Yeah. <laughs> um, e even, I mean, the ways I disagree with them are interesting and so on. You yeah. Know. Yeah. They, they, and you were, they were, able to, you were able to interact with them about that? Uh, David Beck, I mean, David Beck, uh, Michael Beck, I interacted with him, um, before yes. he finished publishing it. There's actually a video online called something like discussing Doy Verde and Klein. Uh, his podcast is, um, Two Age Sojourner. So people might find that interview. But, Part of my complaint is I feel like he didn't incorporate what I was trying to clarify <laughs> <laughs> into his dissertation. Michael, what were you thinking? <laughs> and then, yes, and then, per, uh, you know, also privately with David Vendrin, a little back and forth. We haven't come to the end of that just yet. I have not talked to Michael Strong, but he also seems like a very interesting guy. Probably not a Christian, but you never know. Um, yeah, so awesome, man. That's good stuff. Uh, we can definitely share some links for those books, uh, down below as well, man. Um, yeah, I, I would well, say they're re they're both readable, yeah, uh, by the educated layman. Um, Beck's uh, Covenant Lord and Cultic Boundary is probably, I don't know, the least accessible because it might require some more familiarity. Um, yeah, I'm not sure how to evaluate the level of technicalness in it for the average reader. You might just be like, I, I, just, I just don't know what he was, what he's talking, you know, what he's referring <laughs> to in terms of discussions or something. Yeah. But yeah, yeah. So I think anybody could read these. Yeah. Great, man. Good stuff. Um, yeah, we'll link to the resources you shared, uh, link to uh, the Reformed Libertarians uh, podcast, your personal stuff as well, man. And uh, thanks again for coming on, man. It was good. Anytime I have the chance to talk to somebody about I mean, theology, the church, politics, and that kind of stuff. It's always it's always good, man. Yeah, great to talk to you. Thanks for having me on. Glad we could finally do this. Yeah. And uh, I hope your listeners are, if you know, if they're interested in these topics, feel free to to shoot me an email or whatever. Yeah, definitely. For everybody joining us, like you said, feel free to shoot him an email. Uh, reach out to him online um if everybody enjoyed this conversation like we said earlier don't forget to like the video subscribe click the bell and please don't hesitate to drop any comments or any questions below uh, as well until next time uh, may the lord bless you and keep you may the lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you and may the lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace amen amen <laughs>